27 people have drowned in the Great Lakes, 11 on Lake Michigan alone, five of those were just this month. It is just the second day of summer and it has already been a deadly season on Lake Michigan. Drowning deaths on Lake Michigan have increased by 80%. Something strange is happening on Lake Michigan. While the Great Lakes are well known for their shipwrecks, the stretch of Lake Michigan running between Manitowoc, Wisconsin, Ludington, and Benton Harbor, Michigan has seen more than its fair share of mysterious disappearances. The second largest of the Great Lakes by volume and the third largest by surface area, Lake Michigan is also the deadliest. Every year, dozens of people drown in Lake Michigan. While a lake is a beautiful and attractive destination for vacationers and swimmers in the summertime, its unique geography with long, unobstructed parallel shorelines creates dangerous riptides and undercurrents. These currents are often whipped up by strong wind patterns that create large and unpredictable waves that can sweep unsuspecting victims from the shore into the lake's churning waters. Compounding all of this, the water is often frigidly cold, hovering only just above freezing in the winter months. This gives people only about 30 minutes before hypothermia sets in. While the water warms to a slightly more comfortable temperature in the summer, around 62 degrees Fahrenheit or more, these temperatures can still vary widely and prove deadly in the right circumstances. But the mysteries of Lake Michigan go far beyond these more explainable drownings. From commercial airlines to military fighter jets, schooners, and early French explorers, strange occurrences and unexplained disappearances have plagued the lake from the earliest days of European exploration. The sheer volume of strange occurrences have led some to believe that Lake Michigan has a triangle of its very own. But is there something different about this stretch of water? Or is the Lake Michigan Triangle just another attempt to explain the deadly fury of the Great Lakes. I don't know about you, but sometimes for me, summer can feel like a bit of a downer. It feels like everyone is off on these amazing vacations and I am just at home working. There's such high expectations for the season and it feels like it never really quite lives up to it. You know, I'm really glad that I have a therapist that I can speak to about these, you know, these feelings. And that's why I'm really excited to once again be talking about this video sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and accessible. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's all online, it's remote, and by just answering a few questions, BetterHelp can match you with a professional therapist in just a few days. There's a link in my description betterhelp.com slash bigoldboats, where you can get started. Clicking that link really helps out the channel, but it also gives you 10% off your first month at BetterHelp. And because finding a therapist is a little bit like dating, if for whatever reason you feel like you're not matching with your therapist, which is pretty common with therapy, you can switch to a new therapist without having to worry about insurance or who's in network or anything like that. So if you're struggling, or if you just like someone to talk to, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description below betterhelp.com slash bigoldboats to give it a try today. Thank you again to BetterHelp for once again supporting the channel. By the middle of the 19th century, commerce on the Great Lakes was flourishing. Wooden hold schooners were the backbone of the burgeoning industrialization of the region. The 106 foot 115-ton Rosabel, launched on April 12, 1863 by the Leander H. Boole Shipyard in Milwaukee, was a typical example of one of these workhorses. Designed to carry lumber and other cargoes, the two-masted schooner encountered more than her fair share of bad luck during her long career. In August 1865, she was enveloped in a heavy squall that seemed to develop out of nowhere. The ferocity of the storm forced her ashore near Grand Haven, Michigan, and left significant damage. Her shaken crew was rescued, but as the ship ground into the shore, 
Captain Peterson suffered a severe head injury when he was hit by collapsing spars and rigging. Soon after the incident, he died from these injuries. The wreck of the Rosabelle was purchased by a company called Squire and White the following year. She was finally rebuilt and returned to service almost a decade later, in April 1876. Over the next 30 years, she passed through a series of owners. Sometime after the turn of the century, she was involved in yet another collision. While details of the incident are sparse and poorly documented, it's clear that she once again sustained heavy damage that required extensive repairs. She was soon returned to service and continued sailing for many years. In 1919, the schooner, now over 50 years old, was purchased by a religious community that lived on High Island. The commune sustained itself by selling potatoes and valuable bird's eye maple. The lumber was highly coveted by furniture makers at the time. The Rosabelle would facilitate the sale of these lucrative commodities. During this period, the schooner was typically piloted by brother Ed Johnson, who usually relied on his children to round out the crew. It's unclear whether Johnson had a valid captain's license, but this didn't matter much because just before the Rosabelle was scheduled to depart with a load of potatoes and maple lumber in October 1921, Johnson abruptly refused to take part in the voyage. He later claimed that he had a vivid premonition of imminent disaster. Low fog hung over the lake as a new captain, Earhart Gleese, an outsider hired from the mainland, and a small crew cast off and headed for Benton Harbor. The weather was calm and almost pleasant as the Rosabelle soon vanished into the lingering fog. Over the next few days, the calm weather and the fog remained. On Halloween, October 31st, 1921, during a routine voyage, the car ferry Ann Arbor No. 4 came across the overturned hull of the Rosabelle. The wreck drifted in the fog some 15 miles east of Kenosha, Wisconsin. Her stern was heavily damaged, and it was immediately suspected that this was the result of a collision with another ship. Her crew was nowhere to be found. A lifeboat from the ship was missing, but it was soon found nearby, floating empty in the eerie calm. At first, none of this seemed strange. It was assumed that the small wooden schooner fell into the path of a larger ship that failed to see her in the fog. After the collision, the Rosabelle's crew were probably taken aboard the larger ship and safely rescued. But as the days passed, no other ship on Lake Michigan reported any such collision or returned to port with any damage. In the meantime, a steamer called the Cumberland was dispatched to tow the wreck to Milwaukee. They found her about 30 miles from the shore, but as they began to establish a tow rope, a sudden November gale swept over the scene. The Cumberland was forced to abandon the effort and race to a safe harbor to wait out the fierce storm. After a few days, they were finally able to return to the wreck and drag her to Racine Harbor, where she was beached for salvage. After a close examination, the Coast Guard announced that the damage to the ship might not have actually been caused by a collision, but they failed to offer up any alternative explanation. A U.S. revenue cutter, the Tuscarora, was sent to the scene to search for bodies, but none were ever found. Reports vary widely due to a lack of record keeping by the Rosabelle's owners, but it's estimated that she carried anywhere from 9 to 28 passengers and crew. No trace of them was ever found, and the wreck of the Rosabelle was eventually broken up for salvage. What caused the untimely end of the schooner that sailed Lake Michigan for over 50 years remains a mystery.
trade on the Great Lakes flourished long before Europeans ever set foot in the area. Indigenous tribes that inhabited the region as far back as 10,000 BC traversed the lakes in large canoes made from hollowed out trees or bark that measured up to 35 feet or 11 meters in length. But by the mid 1600s, French and other European explorers began establishing tenuous and sometimes fraught trade relationships with the indigenous people in the region that would eventually lead to the decimation of native tribes. One of the first of these explorers was René Robert Cavalier, Sir de La Salle. La Salle came from a well-off family in France, but found his way to North America after falling into near destitution. He was granted a parcel of land on the island of Montreal in the colony of New France. He soon began exploring the region and searching for ways to profit from the abundant natural resources, mainly through fur trading. La Salle established a series of French forts on the Great Lakes. It was clear to him that the traditional lake canoes were far too small to transport the volume of cargo he would need to generate the profits he was searching for. And so he had a 10-ton single-decked brigantine built called the Frontenac, named after one of his forts. Almost immediately, La Salle began planning a significantly larger vessel. On November 18, 1678, he sent a party to scout out a site where the new ship could be constructed. An area near the mouth of the Niagara River in western New York was selected, and the men began preparing structures for shelter, storage, and defense. Before construction could begin, the Frontenac was lost on Lake Ontario on January 8, 1679, when she slipped her moorings in a sudden storm. The crewless vessel was carried around nine miles before breaking up near present-day 30-mile point. The loss of the Frontenac was a major setback, but construction on the new vessel carried forward. Her keel was laid down on January 26, 1679. The project was delayed by a lack of supplies and tension with native tribes in the area. Still, the vessel was completed in August of that year. Named Le Griffon, the 45-ton bark measured somewhere between 30 to 40 feet or 9 to 12 meters in length, with a beam between 10 to 15 feet or 3 to 5 meters. She was equipped with seven cannons and had one or two masts with square sails. Her exact specifications have been lost to history, but she was by far the largest fixed rig sailing vessel to traverse the Great Lakes at the time. Once she was completed, La Salle sailed Le Griffon on a treacherous voyage up through Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, and Lake Huron before finally reaching Lake Michigan. The sight of the giant ship elicited a great deal of excitement and curiosity from the indigenous people in the area and they were frequently surrounded by canoes filled with people eager to get a closer look. By mid-September, La Salle landed at what's now known as Washington Island, but was then known as Potawatomi Island at the entrance of Green Bay. There they were greeted by a number of Potawatomi tribesmen. Their chief, Onanguise, was already familiar with La Salle, and the two were said to have a great deal of respect for one another. The Potawatomi had a good relationship with the French. They traded 12,000 pounds of fur for European goods, including fish hooks, guns, gunpowder, knives, kettles, various other tools, beads, and clothing. La Salle was very pleased with the expedition. Le Griffon was packed with valuable furs that were sure to grant a considerable profit, and his relationship with the Potawatomi promised a mutually beneficial trading partnership. On September 18, 1679, Le Griffon departed Washington Island with a crew of six bound for Niagara. La Salle decided to remain in the area with a small crew to further explore along the coast of Lake Michigan. The weather was calm as Le Griffon sailed away. Her crew fired a single farewell cannon shot, and soon they disappeared on the horizon. The vessel and her men were never seen again. Accounts of what might have happened to Le Griffon and her small crew vary widely. Some, including La Salle, stated in their writings that the ship was probably lost in a storm that hit the area not long after the ship departed. 
The crew were said to have ignored warnings from the Potawatomi that the winds were about to change. It's easy to imagine that the ship would have been quickly overtaken while caught in a violent storm on treacherous waters that her crew were completely unfamiliar with. But other theories suggest a more human cause. Some think that the ship and her small crew might have been overtaken by other, more hostile tribes. Fragments of a contradictory letter from La Salle suggests that this might have been their fate, but the letter's accuracy is uncertain. Others believe the ship's crew might have scuttled the ships themselves on purpose and stolen the valuable furs. In the end, no one knows for sure. Le Griffon is widely considered to be the first ship lost on the Great Lakes. Over the years, a number of searchers have claimed to find her wreck, but as of the making of this video, none of these discoveries have been proven to be Le Griffon. Her ultimate fate seems forever lost to time. It would be more than 80 years after Le Griffon before another sailing ship would enter the Great Lakes and commercial shipping would be established, forever changing the area and facilitating European settlement. While the Potawatomi saw a brief period of good relations with the French, they would eventually also fall victim to westward expansion. After the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was passed, a band of 859 Potawatomi were rounded up on September 4, 1838. Their leaders were shackled and retained in the back of a wagon, and the party was forced to march 660 miles to a small reserve in present-day Kansas. At least 40 people died during the grueling journey that the Potawatomi came to call the Trail of Death. La Salle continued exploring the region. In 1684, he was tasked with establishing a French colony on the Gulf of Mexico. The ill-fated expedition was plagued with misfortune. On March 19, 1687, La Salle was killed by what was described as a disgruntled follower. It's believed that only 15 of the 180 colonists survived past 1688. The loss of Le Griffon is an eerie precursor, not only to the shipwrecks that would plague the region in the years to come, but also the suffering that would soon be wrought by European settlement. While the ultimate fate of Le Griffon may never be known, her historic impact is abundantly clear. With so many Great Lakes shipwrecks, even when a vessel vanishes with her entire crew, the disappearance usually coincides with a massive storm, making these mysteries less a question of what happened and more a question of when and how. But some Great Lakes mysteries defy such mundane explanations. Shipping on the Great Lakes was historically seasonal due to the ice that would cover much of the water surface during the winter. The winter of 1937 was particularly harsh and the upper lakes remained choked with ice well into the spring. Nevertheless, the season commenced. In the last week of April, the 58-year-old Captain George R. Donner carefully navigated his freighter the O.S. McFarland through the treacherous ice flows. They carried 9,800 tons of coal from Erie, Pennsylvania to Port Washington, Wisconsin. The challenging conditions kept Captain Donner on his bridge throughout the voyage. By the time they cleared the Straits of Mackinac and sailed into Northern Lake Michigan on April 28th, he was absolutely exhausted. Luckily, as they sailed south, the ice cleared and the captain decided to take a much-needed break. Command was handed over to the chief mate, and he was instructed to wake the captain when they neared their destination. Captain Donner retired to his cabin and gently closed the door behind him. It was his birthday, but the dedicated captain didn't plan to celebrate until they safely arrived in port and unloaded their cargo. The weather was calm, and the water was ice-free as they neared the end of their voyage without incident. After three hours, Port Washington lay just ahead. The second mate was sent to wake the captain, as he was instructed. 
He politely knocked on the captain's cabin door, but there was no answer. After a moment, he tried again, knocking louder, but still he was met with silence. Growing concerned, he tried the door, but it was locked from the inside. After calling the captain's name, the mate grew concerned that Captain Donner might have fallen ill. He summoned some other crew members, and together they forced the door open. They found that the captain's cabin was empty. Nothing was out of order. His bunk was neatly made, showing no signs that anyone had recently slept there. His comb and razor sat out on his desk, ready for the next morning. Besides the locked door that the crew just broke in, the only other exit from the room was a small porthole, far too small for any adult to fit through. Nothing about Captain Donner's behavior seemed out of the ordinary. When he was last seen, he looked tired, but he seemed to be in good spirits. Every inch of the ship was searched, but no signs of the captain or any foul play were ever found. The lake was exceptionally calm, and the crew scanned the water, but nothing suggesting that someone had gone overboard was found. When they arrived in port, the incident was reported, and a request went out to all ships in the area to search for the missing captain. But no body or any trace of Captain Donner was ever found, and the cause of his disappearance remains a mystery to this day. These are just three of the many strange mysteries that haunt Lake Michigan. On June 23, 1950, Northwest Orient Airlines Flight 2501 vanished over the lake with 55 passengers and three crew. On July 3, 1998, a high-performance single-jet engine plane vanished with its pilot and a single passenger. And of course, over the years, Numerous ships have met untimely ends in the area. But the same can be said about Lake Superior, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. If you connect the right dots, you can make triangles everywhere. While the Lake Michigan Triangle offers a tantalizing story, it doesn't seem any different from the other lakes. The only thing we know for sure is that the Great Lakes are unique bodies of water with unpredictable weather and geography that makes their icy waters all the more deadly. We may never know what happened to these sailors, but speculation persists and stories beg for a satisfying ending. Thank you so much for watching. What do you think happened to the Rosabelle, Captain Donner, and Le Griffon? I'd love to hear what your theories are down in the comments below. If you like this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more stories like this one. Thank you again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Use the link below to get 10% off your first month. I'm also thrilled to share that I just launched channel memberships with fun weird ass funnel channel badges and early access to videos. You can explore what memberships have to offer using the link below. I'd like to also give a special shout out to my wonderful supporters on Patreon. They would never let me disappear in a mysterious triangle. Alright crew, that's all I've got. Until the next one, be nice to people. <laughs>